Chapter 371 Transfiguration The castle's garden used to be the temple's property, but it had been expanded by the late kings of Karak. Stone pillars and chambers were erected, and pavilions sat under the shade of trees, providing shelter from the sun for the nobility. Varaxis was standing right in the garden center. He was wearing a black shirt embroidered with golden and silver strings, and a trooper hat hung on his head. His hair and eyes were black, his nose was aquiline, and his skin was tanned. He looked more like a Zeracanian than the king of a kingdom that neighbored the sea. The slim, gorgeous blonde beside him was wearing a simple white dress with some bedazzling diamonds on it. A mink cape hung from her shoulders, and when she looked at the man beside her, there was love in her eyes. But when she turned her eyes to the other woman in the garden, they were filled with hostility and disdain. Lita was wearing a green crepe dress with a unique butterfly embroidered on the chest area with some glitter on it. There was a circle of frills at the end of her dress. The dress might be in vogue ten years ago, but it fitted Lita perfectly, making her look even more charming. There was an emerald necklace hanging from her neck, each emerald the size of an almond. One of them was so big it could attract anyone's attention. And her hair was as blazing red as fire. Lita, I've told you, we don't need any more consultants for magic, the man said. If you want to stay, then you'll have to purchase a license, and then I'll generously let you stay as a doctor. But you'll be paying 10% more taxes than your non-magic counterpart, and you're not allowed to interfere with the kingdom's politics, directly or indirectly. He then caressed his queen's hair, his eyes filled with love. The woman was happy about her husband's decision, and she held his arm tightly. Your Majesty, Your Highness, please give me some time. I need to sell the villa, and there are a few matters I need to settle here, Lida answered. How long is it going to take? Give us an exact time. Ildiko raised her voice, her eyes glinting smugly, and her face lit up. His Majesty's patience is running thin. Don't even think about stalling for time. So what if you're an Aratusa graduate? I still win in the end. I'm a queen, and you have to listen to me. One week. Lita answered, one week and I'll leave Karak and never come back. She then smiled as if she felt something. If you have nothing to report, you should leave now. Varaxis played with his wife's hair and waved Lita down without turning back. The light from a magical lamp shone on the pair of statuettes on the table. The lady statuette was made of jade, while the statuette of the man was made out of basalt. They seemed almost lifelike, almost indistinguishable from real people. Even their freckles were sculpted out. Lita held the jade statuette up and gave it a close look. Dimples formed on her cheeks, and her face reddened with excitement. This is it, Ildiko's treasure. They hide her most important secret. She put the statuettes down and for the first time hugged the witcher in excitement. You never disappoint me, you little heartbreaker. And then she kissed his cheek. Give me a few days. Once I get back at that bitch and make her pay the price... I'll go to Novigrad and start improving the trial recipe. Roy stared at the statuettes and saw mana and some weak life force coming from them. They're no simple statuettes, are they? So you felt it as well. Yes, you're smart and you have a lot of incredible powers. Of course you've heard of this. She pursed her lips and answered, It's artifact compression, aka human compression. A smile curled her lips. It's a special spell that can compress the target into a shell made out of jade or stone until they fit in your palms. Roy realized what she was talking about. He had heard of this spell before. Coral knew this spell as well, and she loved pulling pranks on anyone who crossed her with this. The statuette of a nobleman and a soldier were formed. If the timeline of this world wasn't altered, Triss and Yennefer would also be compressed eventually. So these are breathing, living people? Ildiko just compressed them? They can still breathe right now. Yes. Roy nodded. No wonder I couldn't chuck them into my inventory space on my way back. Do they have to eat when they're compressed? Coral answered patiently. The victims are in a state of suspended animation. Their need for food is minimal, and they have no idea what's happening around them. Some of them can live for years in this state. But the longer they're compressed the higher the chances for side effects to manifest once they're decompressed. Organ damage and memory loss, for example. 
I've figured out Ildiko's spell frequency, so I need to unravel this spell and grill them for secrets. A pentagram was drawn on the floor of a spacious room on the second floor. Eight magical runes decorated the pentagram. Three of them were the symbols of Bellatane, Lamas, and Sauvine. Lita lit three black candles and placed three candelabras equipped with reflectors on these magical runes. She checked a few times to confirm there were no errors, while Roy stood at the doorstep with his arms crossed. He was looking out for Lita. A moment later, she took a deep breath and placed the statuettes in the middle of the pentagram, and then she raised her hands and chanted an incantation in a hurry. The candles started shining as bright as little suns, and the reflectors started lighting up, reflecting the lights to the statuettes in the center of the pentagram. The green and gray hues of the statuettes started turning golden, and then they became invisible. Colorful mana burst in the air, and Roy held his trembling pendant down as he waited for the results of this spell. Lyda's incantation was coming to an end. One of the candelabra's shadows covered the ground, and the three runes started wriggling like they were alive. The statuettes were slowly shivering and trembling as they grew in size and changed form. They looked like wisps of smoke expanding on the ground only to disappear a moment later. Mana stopped flying through the air, and two humans were seen in the center of the circle. One was a lady with yellow hair, while the other was a man with gray hair. Both of them were lying on the ground, clutching their chests and coughing violently. Chapter 372 Love Potion. Within the pentagram lay two writhing, howling, and spasming humans, their faces contorted in pain. The man was wearing a pair of thick glasses and a gray robe. An apron was tied around his waist, and he resembled a herbalist. The lady was beautiful and wore a blue silk robe reminiscent of a palace servant. What's your name? Coral was breathing heavily. Lifting two artifact compressions at the same time took a lot of effort and mana at the same time. The decompressed figures were clutching their stomachs, their pain clouding all their senses. Answer me, Coral hissed. So Sonia. <coughs> Vavarsili. Freya, help me. They thumped their fists against the ground and retched, but there was nothing to worry about. Those were normal decompression symptoms. Roy had cast Observe on them, and fortunately, these two were fine aside from some lethargy, and they were regular humans. Coral heaved a sigh of relief. They can understand my questions and answer them. Good. Their brains are still intact. She whispered something into Roy's ear, and the young witcher left the room only to come back with two big glasses of water. The screams eventually stopped. The man and woman instinctively held each other up and looked around them curiously. They didn't seem to be phased by the mage and the witcher, but their eyes lit up when they saw the water. The pair crawled like babies and lapped up the water greedily. It didn't take too long for them to finish the water, and both of them heaved a sigh of relief. They were lucky they came back from a near-death experience. Then they sat together and stared up at the strangers. Who are you people? The woman with gray eyes muttered. What happened to me? It's Ildiko. That treacherous snake did this to us. The man's face fell, and veins on his neck popped. She cast a spell on us, he shouted. Lady Ildiko did this? The woman's eyelid twitched and she curled up in fear and hatred. I remember now. She waved her hand, made an odd gesture, and chanted something in a language I couldn't understand. And then I, I passed out. I don't remember anything besides hunger and thirst. Constant thunger and thirst, the man repeated. Congratulations, your memories aren't scrambled, and no part of your body is turned into artifacts. Lita smiled. You should be fine if you just take a break, a long break but now it's time to repay your favor. Coral said, I exhausted myself just to decompress you two. What do you mean? You were stuck in the form of statuettes for at least three months. That's why you felt so disoriented, to say the least. Coral looked into their eyes. If I hadn't decompressed you, you'd have remained as Ildiko's statuettes, something for her to play with for the rest of your lives. Sonia and Varsili shuddered. Just a few moments ago, all they could feel was darkness and the void. They had no idea what was going on outside, but their bodies still hungered for food and water. It was a fate worse than death, and living like that their whole lives would be a death sentence for them. And then they looked at Coral and Roy. 
Who are you people? What reward would you like? All you have to know is we're enemies of Ildiko, and I want her to pay. Lita said, Now tell me her dirty little secrets. I know it's why she turned you into statuettes. Tell me what she's hiding, and I'll let you leave. Sonia and Varsili remained silent. They were still not out of their predicament. The mage before them might have saved them from a fate worse than death, but she was equally capable enough to inflict that kind of fate on them once more. Just the thought of that made them shiver in fear. You promise you'll let us go if we speak the truth? Roy looked at Coral. He wondered if the mage would keep her promise. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Lita spoke in an alluring voice, and then she threatened. Besides, what choice do you have? My name is Sonia. I was Lady Ildiko's servant for ten years, been working for her way back in Broga, and she was still the lady of a family. The servant licked her lips. I was in Aratusa with her, and I'd create opportunities for her to hit up anyone she liked. I witnessed her falling in love with Varaxis at first sight. Sonia shook her head. There was pity in her eyes, but hatred also stood alongside it. But everything changed after Lady Ildiko married Varaxis in 1261. She started getting paranoid and scared, scared that her husband would fall for another woman, scared she might lose his love and the position of queen. She lost sleep over that insecurity. Roy gave Coral a knowing look. Oh, no wonder she hates Coral's guts. It's not only because of what she did to her in Aratusa, but because she's also jealous. She doesn't want any woman around her husband, especially not pretty ones. Coral noticed the look Roy was giving her, and she replied with a gentle smile. Lady Ildiko's worries were not based on nothing. Sonia stopped for a moment. There was disdain in her eyes. She sacrificed herself and strangled Bellahun with the necklace just so Varaxis could ascend to the throne. But the truth remains that she still slept with the late king. Varaxis let that fact get to his head after he ascended to the throne, and he started pushing her out of his life. His woman sacrificed herself so he could ascend to power, and the moment he did, the guy dumped her. Varaxis is a piece of shit, Roy thought to himself while massaging his temples. If the king has problems with his wife sleeping with his dead father, then he wouldn't sack his consultant like Ildiko wants. We have a chance. Lady Ildiko tried everything to gain the king's love back. Magic was one of them, but any mage worth their salt wouldn't help someone whom Aratusa expelled. Coral shook her head. I've never heard of anything that can make anyone fall hopelessly in love with someone else. She looked at Roy and made a cryptic comment. Love has nothing to do with magic. That is something destiny weaves. Yeah. Roy pretended to nod in agreement. Nope. The elementals have the power to tie someone to someone else. After she was denied by the magical community, Lady Ildiko turned to the regular citizens. Money and her royal status helped. Sonia took a second to look at the man beside her. And eventually, she found him. I'm a herbalist. My father and my father's father worked in Karak and places around it, healing those who needed it. Our ancestors passed down their skills for generations, and thanks to that, life is pretty good for us. The man's muscles looked stiff after living as a statuette for too long. His smile looked almost bitter. But healing common diseases isn't what I do best. I have a certain secret formula that has been passed down for generations. He looked at the pair before him. She's beautiful, and he's handsome. My love potion can create undying love between a couple. Anyone who drinks it will remain loyal to the man or woman they love, no matter how little their love to them used to be. And they will never have eyes for anyone else. Okay, that's interesting, Roy crossed his arms. Wonder if full recovery can clear that debuff. I swear to Freya I'm telling the truth. The Witcher scared him, so Varsili insisted, if even one word of that was a lie, I'll turn back into a statuette and live with the hunger and darkness until they consume me. Freya again? Roy and Coral exchanged a look and cast away their doubts. People who live by the sea put their faith in Freya, a goddess who had similar duties as Melitele. Varsili sighed. But most people who buy that potion only want to use it on the people who don't love them at all. Of course the potion won't work, and I've never made a name for myself with the potion. How does this potion work? Coral asked curiously. Blood from the couple, mixed in with some special components. 
Doesn't matter what kind of relationship you're in, both sides have to drink that potion and sleep for a night. Once they wake up and approach each other, their bodies will produce hormones that keep them attracted to their partner. They'll cast aside any misunderstandings, and hate will no longer interfere with their love. Varsili's face was red, and his voice was passionate. It was as if he were announcing an incredible invention. Only love remains until death does them part. Silence fell upon the room, shadows flickering on the occupants' faces. Roy cleared his throat and pretended he didn't see Coral staring at him. So Ildiko fed the king your family's love potion, and that's why he fell in love with her? That's why he's doing everything he says? I saw him making the potion, Sonia nodded. And it works. His Majesty's love for Lady Ildiko is magnified almost infinitely. They fell madly in love once more and wouldn't stay away from each other. So she turned you two into statuettes because she was worried you guys might leak her secret? That's the only reason. Varsili shook his head and gritted his teeth. But there was no need for that. Even if Varaxis found out what she did, he would just brush it aside out of love. But she had to go the extra mile and set us up. That woman is a witch. Sonia looked a little dazed. She could have killed us, but she didn't. Maybe there's some good in her. Good? Turning us into statuettes and letting us die a slow death is anything but good. Varsili glared at Sonia. That witch is not worth her sympathy. Coral and Roy sorted the information they got. Love potion? More like love poison. Keeping love alive through a potion is cheap. Coral turned her attention to Varsili. One more question. Do you have anything that can reverse the effects of your love potion? Can we destroy a love that's built on falsehoods? Chapter 373. Compensation. Varsili shook his head weakly. Apparently, he was reluctant to answer the question. Nothing can reverse the effects. This potion lasts forever. Are you sure about that? We won't tell anyone about your secret if you tell us. Roy cracked his knuckles and smiled. But if you don't... One last chance, Varsili. Coral grinned. I'm a mage. I know my way around the art of interrogation. You're tired of being a stone, so why don't I turn you into a frog next? Please, no. I'll tell you everything. Varsili shivered and relented. He licked his lips and with a trembling voice answered. Wolfsbane, white myrtle, mandrake root. Ratio is five to one. Make a dose of that concoction and add in lover's tears. That's it. If one of them ingests this potion, they will fall asleep, and the love potion's effects will be lifted in a day. Varsili shook his head and sighed. According to my family records, once the love potion's effects are gone, the couple's eternal love will be tainted. The hatred and disgust that were suppressed will once again surface, but this time, they'll come back with a vengeance. The emotions will be strong enough to destroy their relationship. They'll turn from lovers to enemies to sworn nemeses, and there will be no way to rekindle their love, not even with the potion. He looked at Roy and Coral again. Weakly, he said, Breaking a couple up is a sin. Ponder the gravity of your actions long and hard before you go through with it. She put you in a living hell, and you're worried about her? Man, you're a saint. Roy was confused. You can take her life, and I won't even blink an eye. I just don't want to see the potion fail. He muttered, there's barely anyone who can make use of my family's potion. Most of the buyer's love is unrequited. Lover's tears. Ironic, Coral commented. The potion kept the love between a couple alive, but once the effects were lifted, their love would be destroyed. A seemingly perfect relationship, gone the moment the potion was gone. That kind of relationship was worth nothing. At most, it was delaying the inevitable. Did you tell Ildiko how to lift the potion's effects? She turned me into stone before I could even do it. Thank you for your help. All right, I got what I wanted. She nodded and exchanged a look with the witcher. Stay here. Food will come soon. I've told you everything I know, lady. I swear. Varsili and Sonia started getting worried. Can't you let us go? I would, but Karak's castle is just nearby. The queen has eyes and ears everywhere. Where can you even go? Coral smiled, but it was a threatening smile. You know her most well-guarded secret. As long as you stay in Karak, you're in mortal danger. And if you're caught this time, she won't show any mercy. She will kill you. Sonia and Varsili huddled together. They knew they had no way to escape the queen all by themselves. Once I settle my score with the queen, I promise you may leave. 
Varsili and Sonia nodded in resignation. Before she closed the door, Coral looked back and looked through the crack. You're a fugitive in Karak now, Varsili. Why don't you sell me the formula for your potion? I'll pay you handsomely. Coral led Roy to the laboratory and moved her hand deftly in the air. The elements shone, and an invisible hand whipped up a bag of dried herbs from the rack. Then it poured some of the contents into the mortar. The pestle, oven, and measuring cup danced in the air and seemed to work all by themselves. So how are you going to deal with her? Lift the love potion's effects? Roy was watching the sorceress work on the potion. She was taking all the exact components Varsili spoke of for the love potion's antidote. You have no idea what she did to me, Roy. She cost me my job. She harumphed and raised her chin, her eyes shining smugly. For a moment, she looked almost naive. She must pay dearly for that. And then the smugness in her eyes was replaced by cold fury. Or I will inflict unimaginable pain on her. Roy shrugged. Never cross. A woman. Especially not when that woman is a sorceress. You want me to come with you? No, she patted his cheek. Just stay here and wait for my news. Okay, I guess. On the castle's yard, the warm sun shone. Ildiko was lying in a chair, basking in the sun. She was wearing a light gold dress that day. The dress had holes on the shoulder and arm sections, revealing Ildiko's perfect skin under the sunlight. Her face was perfect, her skin white as snow, her lustrous golden hair tied in a braid. She looked just like a doll, and that doll loved the life she was having. She was a queen who wanted for nothing, and the man she loved was staying right beside her. Sometimes, she could even use her privilege to punish the sanctimonious, arrogant Eretuza graduate. That bitch is old enough to be my grandmother's mother. Ildiko gleaned great satisfaction from seeing her trip and fall, and that woman could do nothing about it. But once again, Lydda came to her again, like an annoying fly that just wouldn't die. My husband gave you a week to leave. You're early. I assume you've finished your business? Her eyes were still closed. She didn't even deign to look at Lydda, as if she were trying to insult her. But he's still in his castle, talking to a guest from Kovir. It's a big business deal, you see. Maybe it'll take about two days. If you're done with your business, you may leave Karak now. Thank you for your explanation, your highness. Coral hung her head low behind the queen like a faithful servant. But I'm not here for the king. I'm here for you. I don't think we have anything to talk about, Lydda. Ildiko shook her head. You're one of the older graduates of Aratuza and one of the most famous members of the Brotherhood. You've been in the field of magic for more than 80 years. But I'm just a student who got expelled in my third year. I'm just a young lady in my twenties. I'm not as adept in magic as you are, and I don't think you're where to talk about magic. She turned over and rested her chin on her hand, her eyes staring straight into Coral's equally blue eyes, and a smirk curled her lips. Are you trying to apologize? Trying to gain my understanding? You want me to convince His Majesty to let you stay? She let out a hearty laugh. In your dreams, Lydda, as long as I am queen, you are not welcome in this kingdom. Lydda suddenly laughed as well, and her polite look earlier was replaced by an expression of confidence. Very well, Ildiko, I'm not here to request an extension of stay. No longer will I be your punching bag. I'm here for compensation. Ildiko froze and she twirled her hair. You are delusional. Did you get your mind addled? On the contrary, I am very much sober. Coral winked at the queen. You need to listen to my demands, because I know a little secret of yours. I know the king is under the spell of a witch's love potion. Ildiko shot up from her chair like she was electrocuted, the smile on her face freezing. She was clutching her dress tightly, the joints on her fingers popping. But the shock only lasted for a moment and she calmed down. Coldly and calmly, she asked, You dare slander a queen, Lydda? One word from me and I'll ruin your reputation. Nobody will take you in as their consultant. You will have no choice but to go into hiding and live your life in squalor, forever. I wouldn't do that if I were you. You see, I have two important guests who might want to see the king. What's their name? Ah yes, Sonia the servant and Varsili the herbalist. She stared straight at Varsili. The poor souls you so mercifully turned into statues. The queen narrowed her eyes, realization and regret striking her at the same time. I should have just killed them. Still, she fought back. 
do your worst. Who do you think the king will trust? The woman he loves, or a lying bitch and two equally deceitful peasants? Lita grinned and went in for the kill. Ah, but this love poison's antidote might clear his mind. Give him a chance to make a better judgment. She whipped out a gleaming test tube, and even the sun seemed to lose its luster compared to the liquid within. A likely story, but there's no antidote. But Varsili told me how to make this. Want to know? Wolfsbane, White Myrtle, Mandrake, Root. Ratio is 5 to 1. If that's still not convincing, you or the king can try this potion out and see if it works. You don't have to drink it, though. Skin contact is more than enough to lift the love potion's effects. Ildiko was pale with fear, but Coral kept staring at her face. She mocked, I have been in this field 480 years. You know how easy it is to make an antidote. Want to see how effective it is? She kept instigating and pressing with an onslaught of words. Varsili told me any couple that takes this antidote will become sworn enemies who will never fall in love with each other ever again. Ildiko turned around, but her shoulders were shivering. Want to try it out? Lida pretended to throw the antidote. Ildiko remained silent and refused to dodge. But eventually, she snapped and roared. Why do you always want to one-up me? Just because you're a high and mighty sorceress? Just because you can gain status, power, and beauty whenever you want, you think that gives you the right to look down on failures like me? You think you can play my relationship like it's a piece on your chessboard? You think you can threaten me and get away with it? Slow down, your highness. You came after me first. Coral raised her voice and slowly approached the queen until they were only inches apart. The queen's body was nothing compared to Coral's perfect curves. I have the same question for you. Why do you keep humiliating me? Why do you try to exile me? Ildiko couldn't answer Coral's questions, and she eventually teared up. She turned around and snapped. Because of him, he took me, ravaged me, and then he tried to abandon me. I gave him everything I had. I helped him ascend the throne. He promised me everything. Love, wealth, and status. But the moment he gained what he wanted, he cast me aside like a worn doll. And he set his sights on you. He desires your beauty. Beauty modified and maintained by magic. He wants to conquer you. Ask yourself, Lydda. If Viraxis wanted to marry you, would you refuse him? She screeched. Can you swear to the source of magic that you aren't the least bit interested in the position of queen? Coral fell silent. She was reminded of a certain handsome young witcher. The queen shook her head and plopped back down onto her chair like a defeated lioness. She covered her face with both hands and whispered, I had no choice. I'm just a poor, defenseless woman. The only way to keep him close to me is to exile all competition. It's double insurance. That's what I need to do to keep my hard-earned happiness. I won't reinstate you as consultant, Lita. Not even if that's the last thing I do. Coral shook her head. You got one thing wrong, your highness. I told you I was leaving this place, but not before you compensate me for my losses. And don't you think love that's bound by nothing but a potion is finicky at best? Ildiko argued vehemently. No, the potion is the best weapon against those cheating bastards. It's divine providence. All I need is for them to have even a sliver of regret, and that's it. They'll fall for the spell. Well, she's gone down the deep end just lost all interest in messing with her. No need to torment a sister anyway. Besides, I'm nurturing a healthier relationship. It's a more perfect love than whatever she has. I'm happier than she is. Lida didn't even bother to hide the pity in her eyes. I wish you luck in your endeavor, your highness. Just give me enough to cover my losses, and I'll leave. I'll even deal with the potential danger to your relationship too. Ten years' worth of remuneration is fine with me. Of course, I won't object if you'd like to give me more. I can swear by the source of magic's name if you don't trust me. Chapter 374 You Never Walk Alone Three days later, a ship was setting off from the port of Karak, the foamy waves gleaming beautifully under the sun. Roy and Coral were nodding and smiling at the old ship slowly leaving the port. They could hear the sound of the horn coming from it. Underneath the red flag with a silver arm embroidered on it stood Sonia and Varsili, happily shouting goodbyes and waving at the two people who came to see them off. Honestly, I didn't expect you to let them go, Coral. Roy looked at the sorceress. Sunlight draped her in a sheen of golden. 
She looked like a mermaid who was lying on the reef of a beach, though she didn't have a fish's tail. Do you think I'm a witch who'd break her word? Lita shot him a nasty glare and held his arm as they left the pier. They're just poor souls who were roped into this situation against their will. They did work with us, and naturally I gave them a chance to survive. They can start anew in Kovir. A smile curled her lips. Don't you see? They were already a couple long before we met them, and their love only strengthened after they were turned into statuettes. We did a good thing. We let a couple live. Well, that about sums Karak's cases up. So when are we setting off for Novigrad? Roy asked quietly. Someone's in a hurry, but we're not going to Novigrad so soon. You're staying for a few more days. Karak has been my home for decades, and I want to bid it a proper goodbye. Coral held Roy's hand, their fingers interlocked. Just like the day before, across the park and marketplace they went and through Karak city gates they traveled. Eventually, they came to a stop at the top of a nearby hill. Roy laid out a red picnic mat, and they sat down to enjoy the view of the pier and the city. You're starting your second trial right after we get to Novigrad, aren't you? Lita pushed her hair back and gave Roy a worried look. I don't understand. Why do you insist on this? It's dangerous and unpredictable. Unlike the Viper's trial, the Manticore's trial is unknown territory for you. It's dangerous. There was an unspoken plea in her eyes. There are people in the Brotherhood who have more chances of surviving the poison. Letho, Aukus, and Serret, for example. Why don't you ask them? This has nothing to do with them. Roy pursed his lips and insisted, This is my own choice, and you have to keep this a secret. I don't want them to worry. You're the only one I told. Coral calmed down a little. Roy continued, I've been getting the same premonition lately. I find myself on a ship, but not on a sea. The ship is flying, like a ghost ship. I see the ship cruising through the clouds and black and white sails billowing in the wind. I stand at the bow, my eyes no longer golden. That can only mean one thing. You went through multiple mutations? Yes. Just like how I saw the battle on Sodden Hill unfold, I have a feeling this too is one of the things that will happen in the future. Roy smiled and his eyes flared with confidence as he announced, Destiny wants me to go through more than one mutation, perhaps more than a few too, and I will pass them all. Roy's confidence stemmed from something else. Over the last couple of days, he collected enough essence of wraith and specter dust for another summoning, and that was what he did. He almost had enough EXP to level up twice. Roy explained, and the trial's data is crucial for the Brotherhood, especially for the kids in the orphanage, they need a safer method to become witchers. You have an orphanage? Lita was slightly confused, and she listened closely. The House of Gawain, the Brotherhood and a ruler of Novigrad work together to set it up. We take in orphans, and it doubles as a filter for future apprentices. There are more than twenty kids there, and they're all really nice. You should take a look. Lita was tempted. An overwhelming majority of sorceresses were barren, so they loved kids. Fine, I'll improve the recipe as promised and hold the Manticore's trial for you. I will stay until next year. It'll be a probation period. If the battle does not happen. Lita narrowed her eyes and scrunched her nose up. She opened her mouth and threatened to bite, but it looked adorable instead of fierce. I'll show you what happens to those who lie to a sorceress. But if it does happen, then I'll be working with the Brotherhood. Delight filled her eyes and she winked at him. If you are a clairvoyant, then I'm going to side with you. Roy heaved a sigh of relief. That's one mage convinced. They talked for a while more, and things were getting really interesting. So, how did you reach an agreement with Ildioko? Roy kept asking her over the last few days, but she only smiled at him. This time, however, she answered honestly. We made a bet, and the stake is their relationship. I bet she wouldn't take the potion or hand it over to the king. What happened? Obviously, she wouldn't see the truth that their fairy tale esque love was nothing but an illusion based on some sort of potion. It won't hold up against any obstacle, but she opted to drown herself in the dream and never wake up. Artifact compression isn't a combat spell, and she can't fight me, so the only choice was to work with me. I dealt with all the problems she might face and had everyone who knows about her secret leave the kingdom, including me. And I gained a great reward for that. 
She leaned on the mat and rested her chin on her hand. A lock of red hair covered her left eye, and she stared at the witcher. She looked almost as curvy as an hourglass. Five years' worth of remuneration. Roy was pushing her hair back, and his hand froze. The young witcher turned around, and his eyes shone. So she's super rich now. She continued. I gave a part of that money to Varsili, so they could kickstart their new life easily, and I also bought his love potions formula. Why did you buy that? Roy was perplexed. The potion was a redundant one, since a couple that was in love didn't need it, and the user couldn't use it on anyone who had no love for them. But maybe I can try selling it in the shop? I think it's going to make more money than the liquid Viagra. It's only for research. I won't spike your drink with it. She shook her head, smiling. Not even Varsili used this on his lover. That's enough to tell me the potion is not reliable. It's not true love if it's not faded and hasn't passed any trials. Roy nodded. He listened to Coral talk as he lay beside her and stared at the sky in the horizon. Coral paused for a moment and turned around to stare at the Witcher. So, are you the fated man of my life? Before Roy could answer, she muttered, I remember telling you I come from Skellige. I adore the sea, and I love basking in the sea breeze. I used to have the same dream. She stared back into his eyes. I would dream of being out at sea, and I was alone on the boat. I rose the sails and rowed the boat by magic, traveling into the infinite seas. The waves and sunlight were my only companions. The sea was warm, and its breeze would whisper in the air like a wise old man. I was alone at sea, and I enjoyed my own company as I drifted into the far ocean. She lay down on the grass. But then, one day, I saw someone else on the boat. He was right beside me. A gust of warm sea breeze blew through the cliffs outside Carrick, and roses bloomed in winter. Roy entered that patch of rose, answering, From now on you'll not be rowing alone. Chapter 375 Everyone's Battles Tredegor, Redania's capital, was built on the ruins of an elven civilization. Unlike Novigrad, it wasn't a city that never slept, and unlike Oxenfurt, it was no beacon of knowledge or academia, but it was home to the chambers of Vizimir II. Chilly northern winds blew across the flags in the corridors of the palace, whispered down the stone streets, and blew the doors of Nightcat open. A pair of witchers took up a table in the corner. They were sitting side by side, and in front of them were a few plates of greasy grilled meat and dozens of glasses of wine. Vizima Stout, Fiorano, Kirsch, Acorn Wine, Dwarven Liquor, and more. Most of the glasses were empty, however. The witchers raised a toast again, and drops of wine flew everywhere, filling the air with the scent of hop and malt. Then they downed their booze in one go and burped. Been a while since we met. You're a better drinker now. Can't believe you're on par with old Lambert. Did you go into training just for today? The man with the receding hairline wiped his sweat away and smiled at his slightly red friend. The man before him had a gaunt face and short hair. He was wearing brown leather armor, his eyes were reddish-brown, and his nose was slightly crooked. The man scratched his nose and scoffed, pulling the burn mark on his chin wider. Yeah, right. You're not a drinker at all. Lambert, you got wasted in Rindy and climbed your way into the peasant's farm. The cow wouldn't stop mooing the whole night. They thought you were a vampire and drenched you in garlic juice. The smell didn't go away for a whole week, and all the coins we made went towards the repairs. Aiden narrowed his eyes. So which poor animal are you subjecting to your terror tonight? That's a lie. Lambert looked miffed. I didn't fuck any cows. I just hugged it like a pillow. It felt like a warm blanket. That was in the middle of winter, and all I did was do what my instincts told me. Got it? And speaking of which, you were sober, but instead of taking me to my room, you laughed at me. Lambert snapped. He stared at Aiden again like he just saw him for the first time. You're a traitor, Aiden. You stabbed me in my back. Aiden raised his chin. Still better than someone who'd fuck a cow in their sleep. The witchers engaged in a staring competition, and sparks flew. Like children, they pointed at each other and started calling names and bringing up old embarrassing stories, only stopping to eat and drink. Eventually, all the wine was gone, and the witchers high-fived. Both of them let out a hearty laugh and sighed. That banter earlier released all the tension they had been holding inside them. All right, we had our fun, Lambert. One more cuss and you're sewing your mouth shut. 
Aiden crossed his arms, a frown wrinkling his forehead. His face was red from all the alcohol, but the look in his eyes was serious. So tell me, why did you leave Kaer Morhen and come all the way to Tredegor for me? I had a ghoul to kill. Did you run into something? Say the word and I'll help. I was counting on that, but I'm not the one who needs help. You are. Lambert stared silently at Aiden. He was worried about his friend. Aiden shook his head. Don't talk in riddles, Lambert. You're not a bard, so get to the point. I have a friend, a trusted friend. He gained the powers of clairvoyance after the trial, and he told me you'd be running into a lethal crisis a few years down the line. Lambert shrugged. But your good friend, that's me, wouldn't let that happen, so I traveled all the way here to Tredegor, just to save your ass. You're telling me a witcher is clairvoyant? Aiden's cheeks twitched. The look in his eyes said, you must be mad. Allow me to elaborate. Lambert told him about Roy's prophecy about the Duke, his daughter, the request, political plays, and the nobles who despised cats. Aiden shrugged it off as some joke Lambert conjured, but the more he listened, the more he realized this might be no joke. When Lambert was finally done, a solemn Aiden rested he, his chin on both his hands, contemplating what he just heard. That was vivid. I don't think an idiot like you could have come up with such an elaborate story. I'm not lying. Fine. I'll believe you for once. I promise I won't take any requests involving any ogroids. Aiden took a deep breath. He and Lambert might fight every time they met, but they were actually good friends, and they trusted each other. Can you tell me who made this prophecy? Eskel, Geralt, or was it Vesemir? He's an honorary member, mate. Lambert looked a little disappointed, and then his eyes lit up with respect. His name's Roy, from the Viper School, and he's their best hope at revival. No, he's every witcher's hope. Under his guidance, we the cats and the vipers are now settled in Novigrad, and we set up a brotherhood there. The shock in Aiden's eyes failed to escape Lambert, and he felt smug about it. Lambert pushed the stool away and walked around the empty inn. Aiden was frozen as if his mind lost control of his body. The notion of witchers of different schools banding together was as preposterous as putting a lion in the same cage as a tiger and expecting them to get along. That's right. We've set up an orphanage in the city too, and we've got ourselves some promising kids, but there's only nine of us at the moment, and we need more people to chip in. Lambert gave his friend a knowing look. And you'll be a fine new addition to the Brotherhood. We averted a crisis for you, so... Hold it, slow down. Who do you have on your side? Letho, Aukis, Serret, and Roy of the Viper School, Kyan and Felix from the Cat School, and Baring Vesemir, all of the wolves are there. Heard of them before? Aiden was fidgeting like a cat. The Vipers were mostly active in the South, and he had no idea who they were. But he knew who the cats were. They were the same cats who existed a few decades before his time. Keon had gone missing for decades, and hearing his name again came as a surprise. On the other hand, Felix had always been moving around. Lambert, this is a serious question. You mean to say witchers from three different schools established a brotherhood in Novigrad? That's impossible. The way they think and do things are too vastly different to even be reconcilable. Aiden cracked his neck. Lambert knew his best friend enough to know that meant business, no joking around. But we have a common goal, he argued. In the name of our friendship, I swear I am telling the truth. If I'm lying, then I will leave and never see you again. He was starting to exaggerate a little. I had my doubts at first. Like you, I thought there was no way witchers could band together, but that kid changed my mind. He created miracles. It's like he could convince anyone if he wanted to. You might be wondering why he didn't come to see you himself, and that's because he has a job to do. We're all equals here, and we're all playing our part. His part is to get a mage on our side. We need a resident mage, after all. Not to mention the mage is his lover, so he's the best guy for the job. Aiden massaged his cheeks and picked two glasses up. He wanted to drink something, but the glasses were empty. Then he felt something firing up within him. You're older than me, Aiden. You know about the tragedy that took place during the tournament. Lambert almost flew into a rage. The rulers thought us threats, so they fanned the flames in an attempt to get rid of all the mutants. Even before that, 
the mages who set their sights on the trial formula and tomes conspired and launched a siege against Kaer Morin and Kaer Saren, just to get what they wanted. If we don't change, witchers are going to be nothing but an extinct species. We don't have anyone to fall back on, but after we set the Brotherhood up, everyone in Novigrad respects us. Nobody even scoffs or sneers at us. Nobody can call us names anymore. Nobody can hurt us. Aiden, my brother, come with me. I won't force you to join us. Lambert's eyes twinkled with genuine concern, and he extended his hand to his bow. Friend, just take this as a vacation to Novigrad. We have much to show, the orphanage, the apothecary shop, and even the lab. You'll have friends there. You can make your decision after you've seen what we have to offer. Aiden was struggling with himself for a moment, and then he shook Lambert's hand. I'm not going to ignore a friend's plea. On the south of Tredegor, wilderness stood, its neighbor Oxenfurt. Underneath the cover of dense foliage and rocks stood the ruins of an ancient palace. Towering pillars stood in a circle, and geraniums and bittersweets were covering its cracked, dilapidated walls. In the center of the palace, an uneven flight of stone stairs led downward into a dark passage, straight into the main part of the palace long buried underground. A loud bang tore through the silence, and in came three battling figures. Two pairs of feline eyes shone in the dark, and Geralt and Keon circled a humanoid monster in the center, swords firmly in their hands. The monster had a head that resembled a bat, a face that was flat and grotesque, and a maw filled with sharp, uneven teeth. There was nothing but bloodlust and carnage in its crimson eyes, and a pair of miniature horns that curled to the back protruded from the sides of its head. The monster had a hairless body filled with pus, but its hide was gray and tough. The witchers thought they were fighting something with sturdy leather armor. The claws on its limbs weren't long, but they were as tough as iron. Tearing a human body apart would be easy for this monster. The witchers came to a halt and stood face to face with the creature. Geralt made a blue triangle in the air and shoved it at the fletter. The fletter was leaping at its attacker from five yards away, but Ard hit its chest and sent it flying backward. It fell, and dust swirled in the air. The monster skidded backward, but then a crimson flash blinked in the dust cloud, and in came Kion, his face covered in black veins. Kion thrust his sword at the nape of the fletter's neck, and blood spurted, but Quen deflected it. The witcher pulled his blade out and retreated to the dark walls, leaving the monster howling in agony. It opened its mouth wide, and a crimson tongue danced within its cavity. The monster ditched Geralt, turned around, and curled its legs up, preparing to leap. A dark silhouette flew through the air, and a gust of wind howled. The monster bared its fangs at Keon, but the Witcher was prepared for this. He quickly rolled away from the assault. The monster missed his quarry and crashed into the walls instead. Still, it started attacking the wall, and the power was enough to tear a big hole in it, sending debris flying everywhere. Someone cast Ard at the monster's back again, burying it in the walls. Its back was turned on the hunters, and it tried its hardest to break free from the stones, but it was too late. Geralt swung his sword and thrust it into the back of the monster's head, and Keon followed quickly, stabbing the fletter in the same spot. Black blood rose into the air before it fell and drenched the ground. The fletter slowly fell backward and hit the ground with a thud. Its pupils were starting to dilate, but its mouth was still moving by reflex. Not bad. You too. Geralt heaved a sigh and high-fived Kian, and then he started cutting the fletter up. The mutagen might come in handy for Carl. Take its innards and skin too, time to start making the pre-trial for the kids. Kian whipped out his short sword and cut the fletter's belly open. The witchers made swift work of the fletter's body and took about half of it. They cleaned the blood up and lit their torches before advancing further into the passage. About a minute later, they found some skeletal remains outside a broken portal and got what they came for, Cat's silver sword diagram. And there was also a bonus too, Professor Sigismund Glogger's notes. Kyan grabbed the notes and for some reason he started looking dejected and remorseful. He handed the notes to Geralt and waited for the White Wolf to chastise him. What's wrong? Geralt asked. He seldom saw Keon look so vulnerable. The man toughened out thirty years of imprisonment and was a nice teacher to the kids. 
Keon shook his head and looked at the notebook. You'll know once you read that. It's a record of what my greed did. The skeletal remains belonged to a member of the Oxenfurt team of archaeologists. Decades ago, Prince Adrian of the Sea Cats dynasty sponsored them on this trip to S. Tyar to search for the treasures of the legendary King Maglor. Keon was the bodyguard the prince hired for the team, though he had another secret mission too, retrieve the diagrams and take it back to Adrian. The scholars found the diagrams in the armory during their excavation, and as per the prince's orders, Adrian asked them to hand the diagrams over. The team refused that demand. They were adamant that everything they retrieved must be shared with the academy. Keon slaughtered most of the team members and took the diagrams. He had a job to complete. Just like most cats, he would kill to complete a request and think nothing about it. Keon muttered to himself, That was a terrible mistake. He crouched down and stared at the yellowing skeletal remains dumbly. And the gods punished me by subjecting me to years of torture. I reflected on my actions when I was imprisoned. When the people who tortured me died, I thought I had let everything go. But when I see this, this innocence who died because of me, I know I owe them something. Geralt said nothing for the longest time, and he shoved Kion's shoulder. Remorse is normal, my friend, especially for witchers but you can't shoulder every single blame. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone incurs debts, but not every mistake can be rectified. Not every debt can be repaid. Reminiscence flickered in Geralt's eyes. Destiny decreed that we survive, and we must look forward. That is the role of the survivors. Guilt gnaws away at you because you have the blood of innocence on your hands, so save even more innocent souls. The children, for example. Raise them. Teach them how to survive. If that makes you feel better, then concentrate on it and put your guilt aside. Kyan closed his eyes for a moment. Then he heaved a sigh and held the skeletal remains up. You have a point. I should look forward and leave my guilt in the hands of destiny. I committed a grave crime against these people, but I have to protect those who still live or I'll never live this down. Kion shook his head, resolve flaring in his eyes. Time to go, Geralt to the abandoned Drahim, where the last diagram is. I'd like to see if Prince Adrian is still around. A couple was standing outside the gates of Oxenfurt. The man on a gray horse had a black hat atop his head and two swords strapped to his back. He sent a flying kiss to the lady in the black dress and veil, and then he left. One month had passed since he came to Oxenfurt, and after a reluctant goodbye to his lover, Vesemir rode happily to Novigrad, the winds blowing his saddlebag open, revealing a part of the armor and weapons sleeping within. Chapter 376 Meeting The yellow sun started climbing through the skies, and the kids' morning exercise came to an end. Thirteen sweating, glowing boys and seven chattering girls took up their seats at the tables in the yard. The kids could always deal with food fast, especially when they were starving. The fish, chicken, and bread couldn't stop their unrelenting onslaught, and the kids enjoyed breakfast like it was made of the best food in the world. A piece of fish fell amidst all the feasting, and a Akamathorm picked it up in a flash. At the same time, he shot his companions a glare. He could see the two of them were about to take that piece of fish for themselves. You're not hyenas, Monty, Carl. Stop taking scraps. This is my fish. If you want more, just walk to the next table and get some more. If you can't be bothered to make that little journey, I don't mind telling the teacher. They might break your legs, though. Hey, your food flies around when you eat. How is that our fault? We were just looking out for ourselves. Next time, be careful when you eat. Carl licked his plate and rubbed his balloon belly. The kids then turned their attention to the girls at the next table and smiled like stooges. After their training and breakfast every day, watching the girls eat became some sort of entertainment for the boys. Unlike the boys, the girls had a more polite way of eating. They took every bite slowly like a princess, and it was nice to watch. They would sometimes show their teeth when they were eating. Their cheeks would puff, and their freckles would dance. Carl shook his head. Most of the orphans came from regular families, and barely any of them were beautiful. Most of them had freckles, wide chins, and big foreheads. Vicky was the only one who looked like she came straight out of a portrait. After a month in the orphanage, her skin and hair were no longer dry. 
Instead, her skin was supple and her hair was silky. Carl and the boys would steal some glances at her if they could, and Vicky noticed their stares. She turned around, only to notice all the boys stealing glances at her. She turned pink and almost buried her face in the table. Beautiful and reserved, Monty muttered, she's the best girl I've ever seen, and only the best swordsman is worthy of her. Carl licked his plate again and grinned at his companions. Once I pass the trial, I'll marry her. You two can be my best men, I guess. And then someone smacked him in the head. Who did that? Carl shot up angrily and was met with an icy look coming from a pair of grayish-green eyes. The boy froze up and hung his head low like a defeated puppy. Felix. Felix stared at his apprentice icily. I see you didn't train enough this morning. Talking about girls, are we? You have fifteen minutes before class begins. Get to the stakes and do two sets of pendulum. Right now. What about them? Carl looked at his silent companions in an attempt to drag them down with him. They need to rest. Now go. Felix kicked his rear. Carl forced an ugly smile and went to the training area reluctantly. Once Felix was gone, Monty and Akamathorm held their stomachs and laughed quietly. Carl got one thing wrong. She's worthy of a man with brains. Monty muttered, and then his eyes went wide. What's wrong with you? Akamathorm put his hand on Monty's forehead. Gorgeous. What are you talking about? She's prettier than Vicky. Monty tried his best to come up with a praise. Her lips are like blooming morning glories. Everyone looked at the orphanage's entrance. There was a woman standing under the plaque. It looked like she came out of nowhere, but more importantly, she was gorgeous. Her white dress clung to her perfect curves tightly, her fire-red hair tumbling around her shoulders, and her skin seemed to be glowing. She was as beautiful as a goddess, and standing beside her was Roy, who had been gone for a week. The lady was holding his hand like a gentle wife, and the kids were dumbstruck to see them together. Their jaws formed comical O's. Well, Lel, if it isn't Lita, welcome to the house of Gawain. The witchers in the orphanage came to welcome them. Akas made a face to the mage and spread his arms for a hug, but the sorceress stared at him coldly. Akas pulled his hand back without missing a beat and wiggled his eyebrows at Roy while giving him a thumbs up. Letho stared at their interlocked arms and heaved a sigh. He then took a deep breath and shook the mage's hand. Let's talk inside, Lita, and we have some new friends you might want to meet. Sarit nodded and smiled. A minute, please. Lita beamed and pushed her hair back. We have a few more people on their way. Who? Felix and Eskel had come out as well. Miss me, cubs? An old, invigorating voice said from the woods, and in came Vesemir on his horse. He had a hat on his head, and his saddlebag looked packed with items. Lambert and a man with short black hair and a scar on his chin appeared as well, and they were engaged in a conversation. A pendant resembling a cat's head was hanging around the newcomer's neck, and then Geralt and Keon trailed behind them. Well, looks like everyone's here. Akaz's jaw dropped, but he looked excited. Come in, people. We're going to have a long talk in the conference room. Twelve people were gathered in the simple conference room located in the leftmost part of the orphanage, and warm sunshine shone through the window. Brothers, the lady before you is Karak's royal consultant, Lady Lita Nade. Akas bowed as low as possible and pointed at the only lady among them. He looked like an usher who was welcoming an esteemed guest. Lita nodded at everyone, but she corrected. Was Karak's royal consultant. I have accepted Roy's invitation to work with the Brotherhood. I understand we have a trial to improve. What did I tell you, Aiden? They're lovers. He's the right man for the job. Lambert whispered into Aiden's ears before raising his head smugly. Aiden was flabbergasted. Never did he expect a mage to work with them in this day and age, and he turned his attention to Roy. He managed to get a mage on his side. This isn't your ordinary witcher. Vesemir gave Roy a look of approval and the other Brotherhood members were stoked. Their plan of building an orphanage and taking in orphans had been going well so far, and the addition of a mage in their ranks boosted their confidence. Thank you for coming today, Lita. Well, I have my little heartbreaker here. Of course I had to come. Coral shook her head, laughing. Then she held Roy's arm without any concern of embarrassment. The veteran witchers exchanged looks, and Geralt looked a little dazed. He used to be like that with Yennefer, 
but now he was just a bystander in someone else's relationship. Ahem, we're all brothers and friends here. Remember the rules, respect and teamwork. My turn. Look here, we have Aiden from the cat school with us. I told you guys about him. Lambert and Aiden stood up at the same time. Aiden, they're the brotherhoods. Remember me, lad? Felix looked at Aiden. Of course, I saw you decades ago, Felix. Aiden had respect in his eyes. He nodded and turned his attention to the grotesque Kyan. Got into some trouble and got myself hurt. Serious injury, but it's all in the job description. Kian shrugged the weird look off. Know who Joel and Gaetan are? Silence grasped Aiden for a moment. Joel is my mentor, but it's been a decade or so since we last met. You know how we are. We go around the world and have no place to call home. The trial venue changes all the time. We don't get to know where they'll hold the next trial. Felix nodded. The school's filled with madmen. You don't have to stay in touch with them. You're one of the sane cats. They're not the people you should hang out with. Want to join the Brotherhood and fight with us? We're a family here, I promise. Aiden fell into silence again, and he looked at everyone. Lambert interrupted. Give him some time, people. Once he sees what we have to offer, he'll come to a decision. And you, we'll be giving him the tour, Letho said. Lambert nodded and gave the happy Vesemir a knowing look. You had fun in Oxenfurt, Vesemir. Looks like some of your hair is turning black again. Didn't think you'd come back after spending a whole month in Countess Mignol's manor. Shut it, Lambert. I'd like to see you get a lady. Vesemir scanned everyone and announced, And I didn't come back empty-handed. I have a few weapons and armor in my saddlebag. Mignol's courtesy to a friend. I have a full viper's set and some bear armor pieces. Do with them what you will. The Countess is rich, isn't she, Vesemir? Lambert rubbed his thumb and index finger together. Can you? Lambert, once again, shut it. Who do you think I am? Vesemir shook his head. She's already kind enough to give us a part of her collection. You can deal with the money problem yourself. Building and expanding an organization isn't an easy task. You have to deal with more matters than you can imagine, and all of you are still too young to deal with the nitty-gritty. You need an experienced guy to help you out with the management, someone like me. And then everyone smiled. Welcome to the Brotherhood, Vesemir, Eskel beamed. I'll give you a copy of the rules and give you some tasks. The trip was smooth sailing. It was Geralt's turn to report. We found the cat school weapon diagrams, and now we have the full set of diagrams for the cat school gear. They headed for Drahim right after leaving S. Tayar, and they found Prince Adrian's remains on a rickety balcony. The guilt of telling Keon to slaughter all the archaeologists gnawed away at him, and he hung himself eventually, bringing an end to the Sea Cats dynasty. The final cat school diagram sat beside his remains. Collecting it gave closure to Keon, and he buried his guilt of killing the archaeologists deep in his heart. Now, the Brotherhood had a full set of woven diagrams, a full set of cat diagrams, the diagrams for viper swords, and the diagrams for manticore armor and steel sword. That was about half of all the missing diagrams of all six schools. So now we need a master blacksmith to research the diagrams and new alloy and make the best gear possible. Roy told Vesemir about Berengar. He hoped the Grandmaster could convince Berengar into coming back. Vesemir was silent for a moment, and his brows knitted together. Then he shook his head. It was his choice to leave Kaer Morin. Not even I can convince him. He's not going to join the Brotherhood unless someone forces him to. We'll put the blacksmith business on hold, Serret said. We have enough armor and weapons for now, and Vesemir brought back enough to gear most people up. Research, development, and blacksmithing will cost a lot of money, and we're not in a hurry to make new weapons. We need to spend the money on something more important, like improving the trial. Everyone nodded. The Brotherhood's first and most important priority would always be the apprentices. Introductions and reports were done. Roy cleared his throat and stood up. That brings our first phase to a close. Good job, everyone. And now it's time for the second phase. Coral will be doing her research on the trial for the Wolf, Viper, Cat, and Manticore School in the underground lab from tomorrow onward. Felix interrupted. Lita, I'm counting on you for Carl's trial. And I have something to say about that. Coral pushed her hair back. 
She kept quiet for a while before continuing. Felix, are you sure you want Carl to take Cat School's trial? I have helped Roy with his trial and roughly went through the pros and cons of the recipes I have. All the witchers stared at Coral. They were interested in what she found. Your school's trial has a relatively low death rate, but the side effects can possibly be disastrous and unpredictable. Even if he passes the trial, Carl's negative emotions can be amplified and destroy his mind. It can turn him into a madman. Coral looked at Vesemir, and he smiled at her. I haven't gotten my hands on the E-Wolf School's trial just yet, but it's obviously safer than your school's recipe. She then said something unacceptable for Felix. But if you want my honest opinion, Carl would have the best chances with either the Viper or the Manticore's trial. No, Felix's face fell. He protested. He's been taking cat school pre-trial for months. You can't just tell him to take another school's trial now. Can't you improve my school's recipe? You have nearly two months left. Coral shook her head, and Roy squeezed her hand. Felix, you have to know that improving the trial is an intricate process. It'll take at least a year to make any progress, and I'm just one mage. I can promise you I'll do my best, but that is it. And don't worry, the pre-trials aren't as different as you think they are. At most, they increase his resistance against poison a little. If he takes the Manticore's trial, he only has a 30% chance of dying. 40% if it's the Viper's trial, and there won't be any side effects either. If he goes with the Cat's trial, he'll have a 50% death rate, and that's under my supervision. She would need Roy to pass the Manticore's trial first if she needed more data on that. So in other words, it's a 70% success rate? Everyone's breathing was getting labored. Damn it. It used to be 30% for us. Lambert smacked his knees in frustration as he thought of his friends who died in the trial. We should have kidnapped a mage. Vesemir was surprised as well, but more than that, he looked glad. Felix spat angrily, but he said, Fine, Manticore it is. He preferred the cat school trial, but he wanted his apprentice to live. They're still witchers. Kyan nodded and held his friend's shoulder. Carl's going to be the first witcher to take the trial after the Brotherhood's inception. This is symbolic, and he must pass. Think about the big picture. And remember Rule 6. No politicking. We promised we'd start abolishing the schools after we joined. It doesn't matter which trial is it. What's important is it helps the apprentices, Akas interrupted. Coral smiled and exchanged a look with Roy. Then I shall be researching the Manticore's trial from tomorrow onward and increase its success rate even more. I will need an assistant. Roy will be perfect. He knows how I work. Letho and Serret gave Roy looks of suspicion. Are they going to spend a whole month dating in there? Kid, I don't want to hear any news of Coral getting pregnant when the research is done. Unlike usual, Roy didn't get embarrassed from just a tease. He shook his head, smiling. Maybe she's going to be pregnant with twins? Yeah, I'm sterile and she's barren. No way we can have kids. Shut it! Coral bristled like a cat and she shot Letho a nasty glare. But then she thought to herself, You pitiful fool. You have no idea that your own apprentice is going to undergo a second trial for the Brotherhood. Only I do. Coral took a deep breath and held her complaints down. Roy and I will try to make sure Carl passes his trial. As for the components, I have two sets of it. I'll give them to you later, Felix said. The mutagens are largely universal, and there's that. So, is it time for me to know what I'm going to do? Vesemir glanced outside the window, and the kids hid underneath the windowsill. There are a few rowdy ones among the kids, and I think we need to whip them into shape. Why don't you let me try it? He closed his eyes and took a deep breath. I feel younger with the kids. Probably can live for a few more years. Everyone stared at the Grandmaster. Vesemir is right. The reserve apprentices have too much energy and nowhere to spend it, Letho answered. And he looked at a lock of hair poking out of the windowsill. It's time to increase their training. Free time is cancelled. Now it's the second swordplay lesson, and Vesemir will be the instructor. The boys who were listening in froze up, and their faces scrunched up. They looked at one another and started sobbing in silence. Coral no, ticed something, and then she leaned on Roy and chuckled. Everyone talked about sending someone to the Povis coastline to find the remaining griffins. 
Vesemir told them the exact location of Ker Saren, but he didn't recommend them making a move so soon. Keldar is tougher than a rock that survived years of the elements and more traditional than I am, and he's a tough customer who won't change his mind so quickly. Without any achievements to call our own, we won't convince him. I suggest we get in touch after we've raised some decent apprentices. In the end, Roy and Lita would start their experiment in the lab the next day and record the Manticore trial's data to make things easier for Carl. Letho, Aukis, Serret, Lambert, and Vesemir would teach the kids, handle the shop, and train Gawain's men. Aiden would survey the place, while Felix and Eskel geared themselves up with the items Vesemir brought back and prepared some vampire oils. They were going to clear out the monsters hiding in Novigrad's sewers and take their mutagens to prepare for more trials. Lita opened a portal and sent Geralt and Kian to the Velen's countryside in search of griffin diagrams. They were the only ones who could go. If any of the vipers went, the crones would swoop down to kill them. Chapter 77 Second Trial After so many years, the oven in the underground lab was once again ignited, the flames shining on two silhouettes standing within. Roy had changed into more breathable wool attire, and he was sitting on the cold operating theater. Standing before him was a solemn, frowning sorceress who was weaving her fingers across the air. Colorful lights of magic converged and blinked on top of her fingertips before they flew into Roy's body and glimmered. A quill started scribbling lines and lines of data on a laid-out parchment without anyone controlling it. For a moment there, only the sound of scratching echoed in the air. About eight minutes later, the magical lights faded, and Lita stopped casting her spell. Then she picked the records up. Blood pressure, heartbeat, oxygen levels, rate of respiration. All normal. You're very healthy. Told you I prepared for a whole year just for this. It'll be fine. Roy thumped his chest. Didn't take you for a braggart, Roy. So you're saying you've started preparing for your second trial right after your first one ended? Lita scrunched her nose and shot him a playful glare. Then she smacked his knee. Now sit down and don't interrupt me. Dark golden eyes, black hair, slightly pale skin. Measures at 5 feet 8 inches, weighs 170 pounds, and your muscle density is a lot higher than most people's. She stared at him and poked his chest. You're at least twice as strong as regular humans, as strong as a bull. Is that a compliment? Well, you know my body best. He smirked and stared at her lips. But won't I feel heavy when we do that? All right, no nonsense now. A hue of red painted her cheeks, and Coral pinched Roy's arm. Roy gasped and rubbed it. Lita ignored him and continued. Aside from that, your skin is unusually smooth. Even most women don't have skin as smooth as yours. There's not even a scar or a flaw. That is impossible. She stared at him with envy. You don't look like a witcher. They usually brave the elements and fight numerous battles. Are you a sorcerer from Banard? Did you take over my little Roy? If you know I have no scars at all, then you must have been really thorough. You're a good doctor. Roy held her hand and kissed the back of it. He stared at her, the desire in his eyes almost overwhelming. I wish to repay you. That's as far as jokes go. She shivered and patted his face. You're not a child anymore. You need to hold it in. Got it? Especially when you're going through a trial. You need to be focused. Roy closed his eyes and took a deep breath, and then he shook his head. Sorry, Coral. I just don't know why I feel so fidgety these days. I just keep thinking about random things, like my mind is addled or something. It's normal for people your age. You just need to get used to it. Coral went around him silently and grabbed his shoulders. Then she made him lean on her before kissing his forehead. Remember how the trial goes? First, the hormones, then the virus, and finally, the decoction. Are you sure you can do this in one month, Coral? You've passed the viper trial and are a lot more resistant to poison than the adepts who are going through the trial for the first time. We can skip through the resistance buildup and finish this in one month. Since you used the furnace virus in Ice Lake last time, you'll need stronger viruses this time. I've picked three out of the four recipes, Fear, Finch, and Silencer. Your immune system will be compromised for a while after you contract the disease, leaving you without an immune system. You'd be malleable enough to undergo the change of the Manticore trial. Roy wiped the sweat off his head and gulped. 
So what do the viruses do? The first one tortures your nervous system and makes you spasm like a patient going through an episode of fits, and you'll feel needles poking over your whole body. The second one affects your brain. Records say the infected would produce sounds resembling a finch. Don't laugh. It's worse than you think. And the third one is the most da, jerus of them all. It cuts off all your five senses, but your mind remains awake. You'd be like a vegetable. No, ten times worse than that. The witcher took a deep breath. Indeed, the effects worried him, but that was not the end. That's not all. The last part is even worse. The manticore trial and your viper trial will fight for control. When that happens, it'll be a life-or-death moment. One month. That's all it takes to know the outcome. But don't worry. She leaned over and rested her head on his right shoulder, rubbing her cheek against his. Calmly, she said, If you can't come back from the edge, then I shall end your misery myself and do it one last time with you. Are you sure I'll feel anything if I'm nearly dead? No complaints. You made this choice. She patted his head, her eyes twinkling. Your hair grew a little, and the style is out of fashion. You need a makeover. She produced a pair of scissors and held his sideburns. Before he could even protest, she snipped his hair off, and they fell to the ground. Roy leaned on her soft bosom and took in her scent. Just shave it all off with magic. He didn't care much about his hairstyle now. A ponytail, short hair, or going bald made no difference to him. Don't even think about it. Coral's face fell, frustration filling her eyes. Sternly, she warned, if you're taking after Letho's style, I'm going to ignore you for a whole month, at least. Roy froze. But the mutation is unpredictable. What if the trial turns me bald? Not even full recovery could help with that. A bald head wasn't technically a debuff. Going bald at your age? Sorry, but bald heads don't fly with me. She purred and hissed, I'd have to convince myself into accepting that new style, or, and stop moving. Sit down. Five minutes later, a short-haired and resigned Roy found himself going around the laboratory as per Coral's request. The sorceress put her hands on her hips and commented on his new style. And then it was the first step of the trial, injecting the elixirs. Coral weaved her fingers through the air and chanted under her breath. An amber needle, as thin as a strand of hair, leaped into the air and pierced itself through Roy's chest. The young witcher felt a cold sensation coursing through his body with every beat of his heart. A shiver traveled up his body, coloring his neck and cheeks in red. An incredibly heat welled up within him, not unlike a furnace building itself in the witcher's belly. He felt great surges of heat traveling through his body, and Roy licked his parched lips. To the sorceress he went, flames almost bursting from his eyes. What was that, Coral? Mandrake fluid? You'll have to cool me down yourself if that's the case. It's adrenaline. You used it once in the temple, remember? I just increased the dosage. Lita smiled. Now you need training. Lots of training. Now move. I, I need you to do this with me. Roy breathed laboriously and held Coral's hand. Ten minutes later, Coral was heard counting in the lab. One thousand and one. One thousand and two. A young, lean man who was naked from the waist up, held his hands against the ground as he moved up and down like a well-oiled machine. Sweat poured from his skin and fell into a little puddle on the floor. Roy was doing push-up after push-up, and Coral was found sitting on his back. Her face was gleaming, and a smile was curling her lips. Sometimes she would smack Roy's deltoid to encourage him. Don't slack off. You're doing 3,000 of these. Chapter 378 Intruder it was a rest day. Dappled sunlight shone down on the orphanage and the children in it. For once, the sun was shining in the winter. When afternoon swung by, the kids followed Aukas and Serret into the woods to forage for goods. All the kids had baskets strapped to them. They sang nursery rhymes as they hopped and skipped through the woods in search of treasures like petite shepherd's purses, dark, wrinkly cabbages, and wild onions growing within the cracks of rocks. Buckthorns and marigolds were on their list of items, and sometimes they came across little surprises as well. Bird eggs on low-hanging branches, sour cherries, and alfalfas for wilt, roach, and scorpion. The air was dry and filled with the scent of soil and tree bark, and the kids enjoyed themselves. Two witchers were leaning on a tree, chewing on foxtails. Their eyes were closed, and sometimes they would tell the kids to not stray too far from them. 
Vicky broke that rule. Surreptitiously, she went in the opposite direction of the orphanage and almost buried herself in the patch of grass to get the marigolds. She was the top scorer for every test and would carry out all the tasks given to her perfectly. Unlike the other kids, she wasn't cheeky. Vicky had no grandiose dreams to speak of. All she wanted was for the teachers to compliment her, especially when they patted her head and praised her in front of the kids for her good grades. Her heart would leap with joy every time that happened. She would do her best to get all the important herbs just for the compliments. Fruits and greens were not what she would go for, only herbs. The grass hid her from everyone's sight, and the girl kept going forward. Unbeknownst to her, the noises were getting quieter. Eventually, sweat started dripping from her face, and she raised her head only to find herself in an unfamiliar part of the woods. There wasn't anyone around, not her friends and certainly not her teachers. They were all left behind. A gust of breeze rustled the leaves and bushes. The alder woods felt like a beast that had woken from its slumber, staring at her. Vicky curled up and little and held her basket tightly. Her fingers were pale from overexertion, her breathing laborious. Am I lost, Sarit? Aukas, are you there? Lena? Renee? Hello, is anyone there? Nobody answered her shouts. Calm down, Vicky. Vicky wiped her snot away and balled her fists. Remember what the teachers taught you. Find your way out of the woods. She calmed down and hunkered down to stare at the tree's shadows. With a shivering voice, she told herself, it, It's the afternoon. The shadows are in the east and the orphanage is in the west. I, I should go in this direction. I can do it. You can do it, Vicky. She took a deep breath and steeled herself. The girl ran and kept her breathing in check like she always did during the morning jogs. For a moment, she was like a squirrel hopping through the woods, but less than a hundred yards later, she bumped into something and fell back down. She held her backside and started to pout. Tears were welling up in her eyes. There was something like a giant in front of her. It was at least six feet four and twice Vicky's size. Sir, the silhouette was as gaunt as a ghoul, and it was wearing a black cloak. Vicky noticed the stench of sweat and urine coming from the silhouette like it hadn't taken a bath in forever, and there was the smell of animals coming off him too. His back was turned to the sun, his face hidden in the darkness. Vicky could vaguely see a long face and bloodshot, sunken eyes, and the thick, unkempt mustache hanging under the man's nose. He grinned, then darkness swooped over the girl. Alcus spat his foxtail out and dug the soil under his nails out. There was a frown on his forehead. Did you hear that, Sarit? I have a bad feeling about this. Kids, gather round, right now. Sarit raised his left arm and shouted, Anyone who isn't here in thirty seconds won't get dinner tonight. I'm not giving up dinner. Go, people, go. Don't let the teachers take our dinner away. Pick up the pace. What are you waiting for? Horrified, the children ran as fast as they could to the teachers and stood right in front of him. Less than twenty seconds later, the kids were already lined up as they used to every morning. Four rows and five columns, and not a limb out of the formation. One of the kids lost their boot, however, and was walking barefoot, but nobody laughed at her. The witchers took a glance and noticed someone missing. Who's not here? Sarit's face fell, his voice filled with anger. Vicky's not here, sir. Monty raised his hands and shouted. The reserve apprentices wanted Vicky to be their wife, so everyone had been paying attention to her. That's Vicky's position. Lena, the girl with the missing boot, said. She knew she looked embarrassing, but that didn't matter. Carl was stomping his foot nervously. Vicky's lost? I can't let my wife go missing. Sir, say the word and we'll search for her. The kids started making noise, and Sarit shouted, Shut up and stay right here, kids. We'll be finding and bringing Vicky back. He gave Akas a look, and the latter leapt to the place where the children were playing earlier. Like a beast, he looked around and saw ribbons of different colors hanging in the air. They represented different children, and most of them led to the kids. However, one of them disappeared into the patch of grass and led into the unknown forest. Akas whistled loudly, and an eagle with gray feathers flew down and perched on his shoulder. The eagle knocked on his armor to say hi. Roy told me you were a smart girl, Griffon. You understand what I'm saying, right? Griffin whistled. Good, follow me. I'll need you to track someone. 
Griffin whistled again and flew out of the woods, circling in the skies. At the same time, Aukis darted into the forest in pursuit of that ribbon. A silhouette was flitting across the forest. The man had long limbs, and he took big steps. The tree trunks, roots, and mulch couldn't even slow him down in the slightest. He was moving as deftly as an ape in the woods. His black cloak billowed behind him, and a petite figure rested in his arms. Her hair was unkempt, her face was pale, and her eyes were half-closed. Her head was on the man's shoulder, and she was locked in an iron grip. Before she was taken, Vicky only had time to leave her hairband, and then she lost consciousness. Before she did, she could feel despair grabbing her. Just when she finally found a place to call home, she was taken away unceremoniously. This man is a kidnapper. Where is he taking me to? Skellige Isles? Is he going to marry me off to some old geezer? Regret welled up within her, and she made one wish. I just wish the teachers would praise me one more time. Just one more time. An eagle descended and scratched the man's face. Gashes were made, and blood was drawn. The man grunted in pain and slowed down. An air current slammed into him, sending him flying back. The branches and leaves cushioned his fall, and the man quickly stood back up. A silhouette in brown leather armor leapt out of the bush beside him, his amber eyes filled with murder. The gaunt man in a gray cloak refused to release the girl in his arms. He grabbed the hatchet hanging from his waist, but then he heard someone scoff, and the last thing he saw was a colorful firework. He blacked out without seeing what hit him. Nobody touches our children. Aukus spat in the man's face. He checked on Vicky's breathing and heartbeat and heaved a sigh of relief. He pinched her nose, and the girl eventually regained consciousness. When she realized she was in Aukus's arms, her lips puckered and her hair swayed. Then she cried. I am sorry, Aukus. I shouldn't have run around. Young lady, the next time you go on an adventure, you tell me first. But you're smart. Vicky was overjoyed that she was praised. Even though she was almost kidnapped moments ago, Aukus tied her hair with the hairband she left behind and turned his attention to the woe, old B kidnapper. He was gaunt, his face was almost skeletal, his mustache wasn't cleaned and his hair was clumped, but most importantly, he reeked of animal urine and nature. Oh, he's a hunter? I see how he managed to dodge my traps. Aukus raised his leg and brought it down hard against the unconscious man's face. Once, twice, thrice, and even more. I'm gonna break your face, or my name isn't Aukus. Marks of Aukus's boot were imprinted on the hunter's face. His nose was broken and his cheeks swelled. Though he was unconscious, the man spasmed. Chapter 379, Meeting at the Seven Cats. How do you feel, Vicky? Are you all right? Vicky was back at the orphanage, and everyone huddled around her. They were inches away from her, the worry in their eyes palpable. Does it still hurt? A girl with pigtails and no front teeth held her friend's hand and blew on the bruise. I'm all right, Renee. It doesn't hurt. Vicky nodded. She was moved that her friends cared so much about her. The girl announced, You didn't see it, but Aukus was awesome. He beat that bad guy down before he even took me out of the forest. Who's the bastard? A kidnapper, perhaps? We're making him pay for what he did to Vicky. The boys were infuriated. Carl, Monty, and the other reserve apprentices stepped forward. Their eyes were glinting viciously, and they announced to Vicky, We're kicking that kidnapper's butt for what he did to you. He's gonna wish he never did that. We'll make him cry like a little baby. Protecting their friends at the orphanage, especially the pretty ones, was their responsibility. Or at least that was what the reserve apprentices thought. Yeah, you guys are tough, fast, and the teachers taught you how to swing a bat. A short-haired girl with freckles around her nose agreed, and she swung her fists happily. You can beat him up if you work together. Hey, they aren't bats. They're practice swords. Carl quickly explained, and then someone smacked him on his head again. Ow! The boy held his head. Did you just say you were going to smack someone, kid? Look at yourself. You do nothing but scratch him. Vesemir made his appearance, and the kids quickly went into their formation and held their heads high. Even Vicky did the same. And this time, no one lost their shoe. Vesemir looked at the kids and thought they reacted decently. The Brotherhood's training works, but he didn't show that recognition outwardly. Kids, you're to stay in the classroom from now on. No leaving the orphanage without permission, 
and no going into the woods. Monty raised his hand. Sir, how will the kidnapper be dealt with? He will receive due punishment. Vesemir looked at the shut door behind him, and worry flashed in his eyes for a moment. And then he beamed at the children. And the five of you are coming with me to swing a bat. Plow stance. The rest of you, return to the classroom and go through yesterday's lesson. You have a test to take. The chamber was lit by nothing but a flickering candle. Within it was a man tied to a chair, his eyes glassy. Sitting before him was an old and blackening wooden table, and it was covered with tweezers, pliers, and scalpels. A group of men with viper eyes were standing around him. Name? Jürgen. Age? 42. Who are you, and where do you come from? I'm a bounty hunter from Nimnar. Nimnar's a city in the northeast of Novigrad, Aiden explained. He knew geography better than most people there. It belongs to Redania. Saret was still casting Axie and he kept asking, Why were you in the woods? Why did you kidnap the child? The man shook his head and his eyes started to glint. There was a struggle happening in his mind. Not talking, eh? We have time. Akis picked up a scalpel and twirled it around his fingers, but he didn't get to play. Jurgen answered, A request to keep an eye on the orphanage, kidnap a girl. The witcher's eyes glinted fiercely. The orphanage was their source of new witchers, and they would not allow anything to happen to the children. Wonder if it's the blasted kidnappers, Lambert guessed. One kid isn't enough for those hyenas, Lambert. Letho shook his head. If they want to take the children, they're going to be a lot louder about it. Why did you want the girl? Where were you going to take her? Sarah asked. Who's your boss? I was taking her to the southeast outskirts, an alleyway behind Seven Cats Inn, going to hand her to, to the employer. I don't know his name or who he is. What does he look like? About thirty years old. A man. About six feet tall lit. Fat. Really fat. More than two hundred pounds. Reddish brown hair, flat nose, beady eyes, pale skin, no facial hair. The witchers wondered where they had seen that kind of man before, but they couldn't put a finger on it. I don't care who the bastard is, but I will cut his hands off for trying to kidnap our kids. Letho roared while thumping the table. That's all? Lambert's scar turned slightly red. He screeched, I'll toss him to the ghouls and watch them tear him apart. They hadn't been with the kids long, but the witchers wouldn't let anyone touch them. Aiden was raring to go. It wasn't every day he got to fight alongside a group of witchers, and he wanted to see how adept the Brotherhood was at fighting. Calm down, people, Sarat asked. When were you going to meet up with him? In a week. Sarat grilled Jurgen for a password, possible hidden partners, and the reward for doing this. And then he knocked the hunter out. We've been lax, can't believe we allowed a pest to crawl around for two weeks. Sarat shook his head and chortled. But he's brave, charging straight into a dragon's lair for three hundred crowns. If more than ten witchers worked together, they could kill a green dragon. In a sense, they were more dangerous than a dragon, and their lair had no gemstones to speak of. No matter what, infiltrating their lair was a wrong and foolish choice. So what do you think? Probably a request from Bedlam or Cleaver. Aukas rubbed his chin. We tried to stay in the shadows, but they probably found us out. Couldn't let us grow our forces, I think. Might not be the gang lords. Don't forget who else we're dealing with, Letho said. The church is even more on guard against us. Cleaver and Bedlam at least have an agreement with us. It's unlikely they would break it. I disagree. Sarat shook his head. The church isn't hunting us down as aggressively as they do with other non-humans. Stealing a child isn't their style. People, may I suggest something? Aiden interrupted. Bedlam, Cleaver, and the church aside, the town hall might be involved in this. You know the upper society hates us for no reason. They take pleasure in getting rid of us. Lambert told him he would die because a noble set him up. Of course he had to be more careful. The air was somber. None of the witchers ever thought of this before, but now that they thought about it, they did have a lot of hidden enemies. The church, the town hall, Cleaver, and Bedlam. Any of them would be hard to handle if they came after the witchers. We need to have a contingency plan. Letho rubbed his shiny head. Call Gawain and listen to what he has to say. We'll prepare for the worst-case scenario and come up with a plan to fend off our enemies. He looked at the unconscious witcher. And we need to make this guy submit. 
then we'll play along and drag the real mastermind out into the light. I want to see who's behind this kidnapping. It's been a while since I got some action. Akas grinned toothily and cracked his knuckles. So, Alonso's manner all over again? Count me in this time. Aiden's eyes glinted, the burn mark on his chin widening as he smiled. Did any of you think this through? Modern problems require modern solutions. Serret retorted. We pull another Alonso's manner, and we're going to be fugitives. He said, even if we have to fight, we need to keep the battle at a minimum. Don't ruin the city too much. We're not only working for ourselves now. The orphanage needs to go on. Should we call for Roy, Eskel, and Felix? Lambert asked. Not at the moment, Letho answered. We'll have to cover for them. One extra patrol for the night, and tell the kids to stay away from the woods. You keep an eye on them, and come up with an exit strategy. I'll see Gawain in the afternoon. Chapter 380 Gawain's Suggestion Underground Laboratory, Temple Island on the laboratory theater was a lean, slender man in thin clothes curled up like a fetus. He was clutching his belly, shivering and chattering. The trembling undulated across his body, starting from his belly. It ebbed and flowed like waves, crashing against even the man's fingertips and every strand of hair on his body. Beads of sweat trickled down the man's cheeks, drenching the operating theater. His face was contorted in agony, and his eyes were closed. He was clenching his teeth so hard they could be crushed at any moment. His gums, like his skin, were red, as if they had been dipped in boiling water. The veins under his skin wriggled and writhed like catfish stuck in the mud. Standing beside the operating theater was a gorgeous lady in a black silk dress. With one hand, she patted his back, and with the other, she touched his forehead. Her beautiful eyes were clear, iridescent blue, but her lustrous crimson lips were pursed. There was worry and reluctance lurking in her eyes. The plan was for Roy to handle fear all by himself, but Lydia's heart went out for him. The lad was in agony. I'll try to relieve some of the pain. No, you will not. The lad regained a sliver of his sanity and tried his hardest to turn around. A hint of resolve flashed in his golden eyes, and he gave Lydia a look of reassurance. He extended his scorching, trembling hand and held Lydia's hand tightly. Trust me. I can deal with this. Roy did not like this hell one bit, but he had to go through it. The virus had to destroy his immune system if he wished to become the perfect vessel for the Manticore's trial, and yet his powerful body was proving to be a burden in this hurdle. This was just the first of three viruses. Everyone's putting in all they have. I can't fail them. Breathe. Roy's cheeks were almost distorted from the suffering he was going through. Sweat poured forth from the skin like water spurting through a fountain. His muscles were wriggling and writhing like earthworms digging through the soil, while sweat and tears trickled down the corner of his eyes. Yet the young witcher held on. He clenched his teeth and concentrated on his character sheet, only to find his HP nearing zero. Activate. And with that, Roy regained 51 points of HP. A cool sensation traveled from his head through his body, and it finally coursed into his veins. The pain was no longer unbearable, and he could turn around comfortably. Gurgles escaped his lips, and his eyes rolled back into his head. Then it seemed like a current of electricity ran from his head to his toe. He grinned at the sorceress, as if the virus failed to affect him at all. The brothers will take care of the kids. I'll handle the mutation. A certain manner, Novigrad's land of the rich. Gawain was in a purple silk robe that day. He was having tea in the drawing room as he awaited his weekly sword practice to begin. He was no swordsman, but Gawain took pleasure in the exercise. But more importantly, if he had the witchers around him, then no longer would he have to fear the church. Someone knocked on the door, and in came a bald, burly man. Good afternoon, Gawain. Hello, Letho. Shall we begin? Gawain stood up, all ready to go. He spun around with some difficulty and raised his hand up as if he were holding a blade. Then he moved his palm and forearm forward in a weak attempt at the ox stance. My men can't wait to learn some new moves, like the angel's march you told us before. Sorry, but I have to let them down today. Letho sat down behind the desk, while Gawain poured some tea and listened to what Letho had to say. We found a little pest roaming in the alder woods. Five minutes later, the collector was no longer smiling. He was leaning on his spinning chair. 
Nimnar's bounty hunter is kidnapping the orphans on someone's orders? He massaged his temples. Sorry, but I've never seen that bounty hunter before, nor do I have any recollection regarding a pudgy man with reddish-brown hay. Ire. But this isn't a total disaster. The employer isn't a powerful noble, and he doesn't hold much power. Gawain said, I didn't join those gatherings for nothing. The employer isn't the leader or deputy of any guild. I've memorized all the faces of everyone in upper society thanks to Orloff's memories and my own experiences. What about the church? Letho asked. The church is a looming giant. It has branches and believers all over the world. Novigrad is where its headquarters is located. The hierarch is helming the church. He's been spending more time claiming political control than worrying about the welfare of his people. He has no time for a few witchers, not when he's expanding the church into other cities. And Chappell, the man who has been on my tail for years, is under my watch. Yet he exhibits no bizarre behavior. The orphanage hasn't infringed on their rights either, and we've been taking great care to never step out of line. There is no reason for the church to come after us. Even if they want to, they need incriminating evidence before they can do anything. Even if they're coming after us, they'd have sent soldiers equipped with swords and dimerisham cuffs, not some random bounty hunter from out of town. Letho nodded. Gawain came to the same conclusion they did. But there's another possibility. The town hall. Some no-name bastard is probably behind this, Gawain guessed. They probably abhor the fact that witchers are involved in an orphanage. You should know that a large majority of the ruling class are racists. I'll keep an eye out for that man the next time they call for a meeting. There are about a hundred council members, and I can't remember all of them. Thank you, Gawain. Letho paused. Another question. Is it possible that the other gang lords are involved in this? It's been a month or so since Cleaver last contacted me, and Francis is acting really suspiciously lately. Gawain pushed his chair back and trudged to the windowsill. He put his hands on the sill and answered, I've received troubling news. Over the last couple of weeks, the number of beggars on my turf increased by a quarter, but it makes no sense. Beggars usually dip in numbers when winter comes. I noticed that on my way here, they are on high alert and always looking out for something, Letho quipped. I see Bedlam is trying to keep an eye on us as well. It's possible that one of those two sent the bounty hunter after the children. Letho sighed. If possible, he would rather not break the peace treaty they worked so hard to get. Gawain, assuming that either Bedlam or Cleaver is behind this attempted kidnapping, what do you suggest we do? No impetuous move, that's what. I know your team is capable enough to get rid of a couple of regular men. In fact, I have no doubt you can destroy most of their men without breaking a single sweat and ruin their gangs. But there will be hell to pay. Gawain knocked on the window, and resignation filled his eyes. If you do that, you'll be breaking the law a second time. And this time, all hell will break loose. We'll be public enemy number one. The church, the town hall, the associations— all of them will come after us. We can't do anything reckless, Gawain sighed. You're our trump cards, something to intimidate our enemies, to keep them in check. We cannot ask you to fight all the battles. That's usually done with skirmishes and negotiations. I'll arrange a meeting with Bedlam and Cleaver. We'll talk and find out what their plans are. Then we'll settle our differences, he suggested. If they did send that bounty hunter after the children, they will pay for scaring the kids. This act of brash bravado will not go unpunished. Very well. Is the captive still alive? Letho shrugged. We're using him as bait. I see. If you can find out who the employer is, we'll have more chips on our side during the negotiation. I'll dispatch a team of fifty to guard the orphanage and the children. Do not worry about their food and lodging. I'll deal with that. A sneer curl. Ed Gawain's lips. If someone tries to invade our turf and hurt the children, lethal force is permissible. 